All right, well, good morning. It is good to see everybody on this beautiful uh, Sunday morning. We could not ask for better weather. We've got this beautiful breeze coming through here. And, um, and so we're glad you're here to worship with us. So why don't you all stand and uh, let's sing out this morning. We're going to worship our King. You have given us a new name. The sons and daughters of your righteousness. You have taken all of our shame and given us the gift of holiness. Lord, we're crying out for faith to believe the words you say. You say we are loved. You say we belong to you. Your grace is enough. Nothing more that we can do. You say we by your blood, by your blood, and all that we can say is amen. You're giving us a new hope. You have given us a new hope, an anchor for the soul that shall not fail. Jesus, we believe your truth shines. Yes, in the darkest night you shall prevail. Lord, we're crying out for faith to believe the words you say. You say we are loved. You say we belong to you. Your grace is enough. Nothing You say we've been born by your blood, by your blood, and all that we can say is amen. Sing amen, your word is true. Amen, your word is true. Amen. We trust in you. Sing it again. Amen. Your word is true. Amen. We trust in you. If you believe it, sing it out loud. is amen 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 it's coming on the clouds 
kings and kingdoms will bow down And every chain will break As broken hearts declare His praise Who can stop the Lord Almighty? How God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah He's roaring with power and fighting our battles Every knee will bow before Him Our God is the Lamb the lamb that was slain for the sin of the world his blood breaks the chains every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb oh every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb oh, so open up the gates so open up the gates Make way before the King of Kings. Our God who calls the saved is here to set the captives free. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. Every knee will bow before Him. How God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sin of the world. His blood breaks the chains. Every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Oh, every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? And who can stop the Lord Almighty? And who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? And who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Nobody can. Who can stop the Lord? How oh, God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. Every knee will bow before Him. God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sin of the world. His blood breaks the chains. Every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Oh, every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Oh, 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 oh every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Romans chapter 5 says, Therefore, since we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And through Him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that the suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character. Character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who's been given to us. Let's sing this. My hope is built on nothing less. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Let's sing it a second time. My hope is built. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love. Through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of all. When darkness seems to hide His face, I rest on His unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. Oh, my anchor holds within the veil. Oh, Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love. shall come with trumpet sound oh may i then in him be found dressed in his righteousness alone faultless faultless stand before the throne christ alone cornerstone weak made strong in the Savior's love Through the storm He is Lord Lord of all Christ alone Christ alone Cornerstone Weak made strong In the Savior's love Through the storm He is Lord just gone through the motions I'm sorry when I just sang another song to take me back to where we started I open up my heart to you and I'm sorry when I've come with my agenda I'm sorry when I forgot that you would know to take me back to where we started, I open up my heart to you. I'm 
caught up in your presence I just want to sit here at your feet I'm caught up in this holy moment I never want to leave Oh, I'm not here for blessings Jesus, you don't owe me anything More than anything that you can do I just want you Just for you I just want you Nothing else Nothing else Nothing else will do I just want you Nothing else Nothing else Nothing else will do I just want you Nothing else Nothing else Nothing else will do I just want you Nothing else Nothing else, Jesus, I just want you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your presence. I just want to sit here at your feet, caught up in this holy moment. I never want. You don't owe me anything More than anything that you can do I just want you Thank you, Lord Thank you for your presence I just want to sit here at your feet I'm caught up in this holy I never want to leave Lord, I'm not here for blessings, Jesus Jesus, you don't owe me anything More than anything that you can do I just want you Lord, this is our prayer this morning. We're so thankful to you. We love you. I'm so glad that your spirit inhabits the, inhabits the praises of your people. Lord, that you draw this, this group of, of saints, of brothers and sisters in Christ to fellowship with one another, to encourage one another, to build one another up, to pray for one another, and then to share in the joys of communion with Christ through worship, Lord, through prayer, and through hearing your word read and taught and explained and expounded. And so, Lord, uh, we pray uh, by your Holy Spirit that you would help us to have open ears this morning and help us to be able to shake out any distractions, to put to death any affections that might be dulling uh, our love for you and our affection and our desire and our fervency for you. Help us to be hungry. Let's pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, if you want to get out your Bibles, we're going to be in the 41st chapter of Isaiah this morning, and as you lie in there in 
the 41st chapter of Isaiah, then uh, let me remind you that chapter 40 is the comfort chapter. And so after 39 chapters, as it were, of uh, prophecy concerning discomfort, what God does is he, in chapter 40, changes direction and starts to portray himself as the God of comfort. And so he begins, comfort ye, or comfort yes, comfort yes, my people. Now last week when we finished up that chapter, we looked at God portraying himself as great because if God is going to be able to comfort in all circumstances and situations, he must be greater than every circumstance and situation. And so God is great. He is incomparable. And when we land in the 40th chapter of Isaiah in the last verse, it says, verse 31 of chapter 40, But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with the wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. And so those who wait on the Lord, he will renew. But instead of in the renewing process taking us from walking to running to soaring, he takes us from soaring to running to walking. And he gives us the ability as he renews us progressively to endure, to outlast, uh, to overcome by just... Uh, going longer and further than most of the stupidity that we encounter in life. We outlast stupidity, if you will, as he renews us. And so this process is progressive, and yet all because of his greatness. Now in chapter 41, he dovetails on this idea of his greatness by emphasizing his superiority. If you go to our church website on the front scroll there, you can look at the slides we would have if we were inside and that said uh, this chapter is if you will a courtroom scene where God calls all of the heathen nations in front of his bench to the you might say superior court of the universe he's the judge and so he's calling them to if they can contest his superiority and so in Chapter 41, verse 1, it reads, Keep silence before me, O coastlands, and let the people renew their strength, and let them come near, and then let them speak, and let us come near together for judgment. So in verse 1, in this courtroom scene, the court is called to order by the judge, if you would, and the judge invites the coastlands or the nations other than the Jews who would make a case for their gods to be the true and living God to come forward. Now he says initially, keep silence. And the reason for that is these are the nations that would normally rage according to Psalm 2 against the Lord. And when he gives them an opportunity to make their case for their own power... He tells them initially, keep silence because the court of the Lord is a court of order. Please note that God is a God of order. So wherever there's chaos and craziness, it's not of God. And so God calls these to order to make a case for their gods. Now in verse 2, he asks them, Who raised up one from the east, who in his righteousness called him to his feet who gave the nations before him and who made him this one he raised up rule over kings who gave them as dust to his sword as driven stubble to his bow who pursued them and passed safely by the way that he had not gone with his feet who has performed and done it calling the generations from the beginning Who's done all these things is a question. Here's the answer. I, the Lord, am the first, and with the last, I am he. And so in verses 2 through 4, the judge, he says here, 
I'm raising up one from the east. Now you can read voluminously about who this may be, but it is probable that this is Cyrus uh, the Great. And historically, he fits the time period, and then in context, he is mentioned by name in Isaiah 44, verse 28, God calls Cyrus his anointed servant 150 years before his birth. Cyrus reigned from 590 to 530 B.C. He, as a Persian king, united many of the tribes into an empire. He was a man who conquered more of the earth than anyone before him, and he ended the Babylonian ca captivity. He, he overcame the great Babylonian empire, and then he allowed the Jews, he was handpicked by God, this pagan Persian king, the one the Lord called his anointed, to allow the Jews to go back to their homeland. And so, when we read this, what God's saying to all these nations who would come before him and make their case for their gods and their strength, he's saying, from you guys, I'm actually going to handpick someone to use for my purposes from the east, from these tribes of the east. And Cyrus the Great would be that one, which reminds us, by the way, in this election season, that any politician or ruler can be used as the Lord's anointed to fulfill his purposes. So no matter come the end of November, whether you've been riding with Biden or you've been on the Trump train, please understand this. Because for some of us, the end result is going to be easier for us to handle than the rest of us. And if it's in our favor, we declare the hand of the Lord. This must be the Lord's anointed. And if the person that we don't believe is the right one is the one elected, we declare can't be the hand of the Lord, not the Lord's anointed. But the Bible says this, the next president we get will be the anointed of the Lord to fulfill his purposes in our country, whether you and I like it or not. Vote as the Lord in your conscience tells you, but then know that whoever we get is indeed who God allowed for us to have. Now, all that said, he says to these guys, look, I'm going to raise up one for my own purposes from you who typically rage against me. And in verse 5, the coastland saw it and feared. What did they see? They saw God's superiority. He says, I just use you as I desire. I'll raise up one from you even if you're not for me. And so how do they respond? They saw it and feared, verse 5 says, the ends of the earth were afraid and they drew and they came near and everyone helped his neighbor. Look at this, it's unity. When they saw the superiority of God, they put their arms together, they linked arms and they were unified and they said, hey, be of good courage. And so what did they do in this unity? So the craftsman encouraged the goldsmith. He who smooths with the hammer inspired him who strikes with the anvil, saying, it's ready for the soldering. And then he fastened it with pegs that it might not totter. So this is the response of the nations before the superiority of God. They unified together. And what did they do? They made idols to try to withstand the true and the living God. Man will always be in unity together against only one thing, and that is God. Man will lay down all of their issues to unify against the true and the living God. And so that's what happens. And so they make themselves an idol in their own likeness because God's too big for them. They don't understand him. They don't like him because he's not like them. And they fashion themselves an idol. And then look at this. So their idol can't be knocked over by God's superiority, they nail him into place. Just let me say this. If you have to nail your idol in place, he's not big enough. And yet the truth is that anything we build our life on, 
besides the true and living God, is an idol. And the reality is most of us wear ourselves out trying to keep those idols nailed in place. We drive one over here and it totters. We drive one over here and it totters. And so God himself holds himself in place. And in contrast to the idols that are fashioned in men's likeness, then think about this. Jesus, God in the flesh, was nailed willingly to the cross. And he then chose to stay nailed. He said, no one takes my life, I lay it down. He chose to stay nailed to the cross so that we might rise from the results of the fall. This is beautiful in contrast. He's completely superior to any other idol or God. And yet man responds against him. They respond in rebellion to his superiority. Verse 8, now he wants to address Israel. He's addressed the nations, and now he says, but you, Israel, you are my servant. See, this is key because the nations that he's talking to oppress Israel. The nations that he's talking to, they actually take Israel into bondage. The nations that he's talking to look down on little bitty Israel, but he says, guess what, Israel, you who've fallen, you who have been disobedient, you're still my servant. And Jacob, you're whom I have chosen, the descendants of Abraham, my friend, you whom I have taken from the ends of the earth and called from the farthest regions and said to you, you are my servant. I have chosen you and I've not cast you away. And therefore, he says, verse 10, fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. So what the judge is saying to his own people is, I am loyal to those who are my own. And in Romans chapter 11, Paul picks up this theme, and he says, has God rejected his people Israel? And, and he proclaims, no way. He goes on to say in Romans 11, the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. And then he goes on to say in Romans 11, that when the Jewish people rejected the Messiah, God gave them blindness in part, and a partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles would come in. And in God's beauty and his graciousness, as the Jews rejected Jesus, they, the Jews, his cultivated olive tree that he put all this time into, as that tree rejected the Messiah, he allowed the wild branches of the Gentiles to be grafted in in this time of the Gentiles. And so over the last 2,000 years, there's been all this grace as the church has been largely Gentile. And until the fullness of the Gentiles, or that time when the last Gentile believer would be saved, he's just using the blindness of the Jews and the hardening of their hearts partially. And when the last Gentile believer is saved, he'll close up the church age and he'll once again deal with his servants, the Jews. Now that said, what Paul writes about in Romans 11 is what God is trying to emphasize here. And that's that God's faithfulness to Israel proves his faithfulness to me. Because you see, it's easy for us to look at Israel and go, they've blown it, they rejected him, they got off the path, they ran it off in the ditch. God, you ought to get rid of them. There's whole segments of the church that believe Israel's been replaced because they were not faithful. Hey, guess what? That's not very comforting. The reality is God's faithfulness to his Jewish people proves his faithfulness to you and I. And as I look back over my life, I don't know that there's any season, hindsight being what it is, that I was ever actually doing as well as I probably could. I had mixed motives. My heart was wrong. I thought I was good in lots of seasons. But the reality is, you know, if, if everybody would like to be a V8 engine, the best I was ever doing at any given season of my life was hitting on four out of eight cylinders. And, and then the reality is I got about 45 and I realized I don't even know that I'm an engine that could motivate a car. I'm like a five-horse Briggs and Stratton lawnmower engine. I'm loud. I'm air-cooled. 
um, liable to foul up. And the truth is that if it was on me and my faithfulness, then what good would it be? But God, he's the one who sets us in motion. He's the one that gives us our horsepower. And he's the one who sustains us. And God is loyal to his own. He's loyal. He's always using even our difficulties and our departures for his glory. And so he says, don't fear. That might be a verse, verse 10 for some of us this morning. Fear not, for I am with you. We tend to think, well, if I'm doing good, God's with me. And if I'm not doing good, God's with me. But the Bible says, no, God is with you. Is God with me or is he not with you? God's with me, good or bad. Now, verse 11 Behold, all those who were incensed against you shall be ashamed and disgraced. They shall be as nothing, and those who strive with you shall perish. You shall seek them and not find them, those who contend with you. Those who war against you shall be as nothing, as a non-existent thing. So the judge says that he will judge those who mistreat his servants. And Particularly here, he's talking about Israel. And this is something that God instituted when he called Israel's father, his friend, Abraham. And in Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, he said to Abraham, I'm going to bless those who bless you. I'm going to curse those that curse you. And it will be through you that all the families of the earth shall be blessed. This ultimately was talking about the Messiah would come from the nation of Israel. So in about 14 weeks, when we get to Isaiah 54... We will read no weapon, verse 17, that's fashioned or formed against you shall prosper. No matter what has ever come up against the Jewish people, when it looked like they were about to be down and out, exterminated, gone, God has left a remnant, and from that remnant, he has allowed them to flourish now in these last days, Israel being at the very least a timeline of what God's doing, a rebirth of a nation that should have been by any accounts, sociologically, culturally, ethnically gone years and years ago but the judge is going to uphold israel and then he's going to judge those who mistreat israel one key point to consider when voting for a president is what is that person's platform regarding israel keep that in mind as you cast your ballot this fall now verse 13 he says for i the lord your god will Hold your right hand, saying to you, Fear not, I will help you. Verse 14, Fear not, you worm Jacob, you men of Israel. I will help you, says the Lord, and your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. Behold, I will make you into a new threshing sledge with sharp teeth, and you shall thresh the mountains and beat them small and make the hills like chaff. And you shall winnow them, the wind shall carry them away, and the whirlwind shall scatter them, and you shall rejoice in the Holy One, or the Lord, the glory in the Holy One of Israel is what you will rejoice in. And so the judge knows the state of his people, and he says to his people, fear not, I know who you are, who are you? Well, you're a worm. What, God called me a worm? Yeah, you're a worm. He says, you're Jacob. When God addresses the nation of Israel as Jacob, Jacob means heel catcher or deceiver. Jacob would go out through his life manipulating and deceiving and doing things in his own strength. And when he is old, God would press his finger right there in his hip, dislodge his socket because he, he didn't want him to, to be in his own strength anymore. And then Jacob would finally be renamed Israel. He'd go with a limp, but he was governed with God. Governed by God. And so... When God wants to emphasize the things that nobody likes about themselves regarding the nation of Israel, he calls them Jacob, or in this case, just for emphasis, he says, look, I know you're a worm. Psalm 103, by the way, he says, God knows our frame, we are but what? Dust. On my best day, I'm worm guts. Ever think about a worm? Worm doesn't really have much going for it. Sometimes when I fish for bluegill out here, I use worms, and used to go dig worms myself and then I wouldn't get enough and so I'm like hey I'm catching fish I don't have enough worms there's a remedy for this situation I have 10 worms I need 20 worms I will just take said worm and pinch little worm in half 
you ever seen that happen? You, and he's squirming. He's like, no, like, no, buddy. And just squeeze, and the dirt just comes right out of both, both of the places you've dissected. So, well, God just called me a worm. Well, think about this. He called you and I a worm, called Jacob a worm. But in Psalm 22, 6, Jesus, uh, letting the prophet write of himself, says, But I am a worm, and no man. I'm a reproach of men, and I'm despised by people. When Jesus hung on the cross, he let himself become a worm to save worms. He became an earth worm to save earth worms. Technically, it's toloth worm, but that's a whole other story. The point is Jesus can identify with worms, and when he comes to save worms, and here's what he does with worms. Look at the rest of the passage. He makes a worm a threshing a threshing sledge. This is a worm that's a bad motor scooter. A worm with big old teeth. Now forgive me, but when I think about this, this will show your age if you know this movie. If you don't know this movie, you're too old. If you don't know this movie, you're too young. If you do know this movie, you're just right. And that's, uh, and it's got Kevin Bacon in it, which is every movie six degrees from Kevin Bacon, right? And, and Tremors. Anybody ever see Tremors? The baddest earthworm in the history of earthworms. And I mean, you can't get away from Tremors. I mean, you're running across the desert. That dude's, he's burrowing. He's popping up. People are like, hey, I think I'm, ah! <laughs> And do you ever think about this? God, God's got a sense of humor because he says, you're a worm, but I'm going to, in my grace, make you into Tremor. <laughs> so when you feel like a worm, and we all do from time to time, then you just look in the mirror the next time you feel like a worm and say, I'm not a worm, I'm a trimmer. Hey, the things that come up against me, I'm going to swallow them up. Hey, my teeth are a threshing sledge. Just speak encouragement into your life, <laughs> you worms. <laughs> you got to love the Lord. And he knows the state of our people, but he also knows what he's making us. You see, we always look at what we were or what we're not, or what we won't ever be, and God says, no, I, I, I speak into existence the things that, that aren't. Verse 17, the poor and the needy seek water, but there is none. Their tongues fail for thirst. I, the Lord, will hear them. I, the God of Israel, will not forsake them. I will open rivers in desolate heights and fountains in the midst of the valleys. I will make the wilderness a pool and the dry land springs of water. I will plant, verse 19, the wilderness in there, the cedar and the acacia tree and the myrtle and the olive tree, and I will set in the desert the cypress tree and the pine and the box tree together that they may see and know and consider and understand together that the hand of the Lord has done this. The Holy One of Israel has created it. And now here we see that the judge reclaims waste places for his glory. And by the way, this is the theme of the Bible. He takes uh, worms and waste places and he reclaims them for his glory. Years ago when we bought this property, it was so run down. And the Lord gave me, when we get to Isaiah 58, he picks up on this theme where he says, you know, that I've, I've called you to restore the old waste places. And so for years, we've been just fixing this place up for his glory because to me, it seems like that's how he does our Christian life. It's never immediate that everything takes place. It's gradually, little by little, little by little, line upon line, here a little, there a little. And, and then gradually, you know, out on double O where all the car lots are and people are racing their four-wheelers and people are burning trash that floats over my house like a mushroom cloud, I have to sweep off on Saturday morning. Right in the middle of all that, God's creating something beautiful. Right in the middle of the midst of the mess, just like you and I in the midst of this world. Now, now that, that said, here what he's talking about specifically is Israel. Israel is, a, is by nature a desert geography and a, and a swamp. It's, it's deserts and swamps. And after the Roman invasion of 70 AD, when, when they basically um, depopulated Israel... They also deforested Israel. 
And over the years, since 70 AD, for the last 2,000 years, largely every group that ever come through and take over Israel, and there's been many, they would deforest the land. It's one of the ways that they would make it pretty much uninhabitable. So when the Zionist movement happened, when uh, Israelites, Jews from all over the known world become to f- began to flood back to the promised land in the late 1800s, there was something that happened. They started planting trees, and they did this for a couple reasons. The first reason was that, that trees uh, designated ownership. You were investing in the land. But secondly, uh, it, it helped them cultivate the land, and so be- basically up in the Hula Valley, there's a ton of swamps, and so they planted eucalyptus trees because eucalyptus trees dry up the swamps, and therefore those places became fertile uh, instead of just marshes and mosquito infested. Down in the Judean mountains, they had all these rock uh, bluffs and, and hills, so they planted pine trees and fir trees because apparently, you know, you go out uh, 8 Highway here, and you get right towards Leadwood, and they got all that blasted away, and you notice all the pines that are growing... Pines will grow anywhere in the world except my yard. And so they planted them in these, these rock bluffs and cliffs, and the roots began to spread out and break the rocks, and therefore then they could cultivate and terrace the hills and make them usable for agriculture. And so they began to plant trees. And to promote growth, the Israeli government planted a bunch of trees once there was a nation established, but they also started the Jewish National Fund, this tran- a plant a tree uh, promotion and for years for a few dollars you can go plant a tree and so uh, you can dedicate it to somebody you know and and so since 1940 I believe there have been between 240 and 300 million trees planted in Israel they've literally reforested the whole nation and so God's saying, when you see this, you might say, well, oh, man, look at Israel. Their irrigation methods are uh, second to none. Look how they've made the desert bloom. Look how people have planted trees. It mu- no, it's not them. Guess who did it? He says, it's me. When you see Israel reforested, it's me. And so when we go next year, there's still spots if you want to go. You don't have to be afraid. You're going to the Holy Land. We'll go in June, and what you're going to see is trees everywhere, and you'll know God did this. This is a reflection of God's Word. And what I'm going to do, I've always wanted to do this. I'm going to take a side bar, and I'm going to get me, and the, the, the emblem, the symbol of this program is this little tree in the hands. I'm going to get me a little tree, and I'm going to pay my money, and I'm going to plant it, and they're going to send me my certificate, and I'm naming this tree Luscious Lucinda. Thought about it a little bit. And, and God, he says, I want you to understand when I rebuild places, it's me. Now, verse 21, he says, Present your case, says the Lord. Bring forth your strong reasons, says the king of Jacob. And let them bring forth and show us what will happen. Let them show us the former things, what they were, that we may consider them. And he says, know the latter end of them, or declare to us things to come. Note that. Show the things that are to come hereafter, that we may know that you are God's. Yes, do good or do evil, that we may be dismayed and see it together. Indeed, he says, you are nothing and your work is nothing. He who chooses you is an abomination. Now the Gods that the Israelites had given themselves to were all worthless. Gods of other nations. So God says, I am the true and living God, and I'm going to prove it to you by reforesting a land that's completely been depopulated, deforested. But now the judge provides proof of his superiority because he says, I'll tell you how you can really prove that you are superior to me. Predict the future. Predict the future with accuracy. And you might jot this down, you like to take notes, that 26.8% of your Bible is predictive prophecy. If you don't like prophecy, you got a problem with one quarter of the Bible. 
And it's one quarter predictive prophecy because predictive prophecy fulfilled distinctly is the thing that separates our Bible from any other holy book. Hundreds of years before things happened, the Bible predicts it and then it comes to pass and there is no way that the writers of the New Testament could have collaborated together and redacted the New Testament in such a way that they could have fit the narrative to fulfill all the predictive prophecy in the Old Testament. So I want to just take a moment here and give you an illustration. There are over 300 prophecies in the Old Testament concerning the Messiah. And at His first coming, He actually fulfilled dozens of them. But... Uh, the probability of any one person fulfilling just eight of them is highly unlikely. Let me give you eight prophecies that were predicted no less than 500 years before Jesus came about Jesus that he fulfilled. It was his place of birth predicted, where he would be born, and that was fulfilled. The time of his birth, the manner of his birth, born of a virgin. Later, his betrayal, the manner of his death, the people's reaction to his death, uh, the piercing down to the piercing of his side, and finally, uh, his burial. Now, we could go on and on about the prophecies that were predicted of Jesus that he fulfilled, but that's just eight. Now, the chances of any one man fulfilling eight prophecies predicted of them is 10 to the 17th power. That's 10 with 17 zeros behind it. Now, I'm not good with numbers, so let me, let me paint a picture for you. What 10 with 17 zeros behind it looks, at, looks like as a, as a chance is this. And, and you can find this particular illustration in Lee Strobel's book. He interviewed a theologian in his book, The Case for Christ. And, and this guy gave this illustration. And by the way, if you have... Any agnostic or atheist friends, the book, The Case for Christ, it, it hits it out of the park. I've given that book to three people in my life that were agnostic or atheist, and two of them became Christians, and one of them is still a deacon down in Mississippi at a little Baptist church. So that said, Lee Strobel asked a theologian, um, what are the chances that any one man could fulfill eight of the prophecies in the Old Testament predicted of the Messiah? And he said, this is what it would be like. Cover the state of Texas. Now, who's ever driven across Texas? Now, you're reluctant to raise your hand because you hope it never happens again. Uh, Texas. And, and so cover the state of Texas two feet deep with silver dollars. Now, in that state of Texas covered two feet deep with silver dollars, you take your own silver dollar and you paint it bright red, and then you place it anywhere in the state of Texas that you want in the pile of two-foot-thick silver dollars. Now, you take a person, you blindfold said person at the edge of the state of Texas, you spin them around eight times, you push them off into the state of Texas, and the chance that that person blindfolded on their first attempt could pick up the red silver dollar, that's the chance that one man had in fulfilling just eight prophecies of the Old Testament. This is an amazing God we serve. This book is an amazing book that we read. And the predictive prophecy proves the superiority of our God over any other gods. Now verse 25, he says... I have raised up one from the north. Uh, who's that? That's Cyrus again. You said, Roro Raggy, I thought he was from the east. Well, you're right. He came from the east, and then when he would conquer the Babylonian Empire, he would go north, and then so from the east, he would go north, and then he would arrive from the east uh, via the north to Israel. And he shall come. From the rising of the sun, he shall call on my name. And he shall come against princes as though mortar. As the potter treads the clay, he's going to crush everybody in his path. Who has declared from the beginning that we may know? 
and the former things that we may say, he's righteous? Who's declared this? Surely there is no one who shows. Surely there is no one who declares. Surely there is no one who hears your words. The first time I said to Zion, look, there they are. And I will give to Jerusalem one who brings forth good tidings. I looked when I said this and there was no man. I looked, there was no one among them that could counsel who when I asked of them could answer a word. And indeed, they are all worthless. Their works are nothing. Their molded images are wind and confusion. And so here's God's verdict on any God that man would build their life upon, any wisdom that man would build his life upon apart from the true and living God. That's this. Apart from God, all greatness of men is worthless. There is no true greatness of man. It's all worthless apart from God. And so since man cannot, since man cannot, God says, I will. Now, as we close here, I just want you to maybe jot down in your margins that this is called the I will chapter of the Old Testament. And it's called the I will chapter of the Old Testament. You know why? Because as we were going down through this chapter, you were circling in your Bible or highlighting in your idle phone all the I wills. You noticed that because you're observing. You're observant. I appreciate that about you as Bible students. So just in case you missed one, let me back up and we'll start in verse 10. And I just want to show you the 12 I wills in this chapter concerning Israel. And what he speaks of Israel proves how he will be with us. Verse 10, I will strengthen you, is what God says. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Now, God upholds with his righteous right hand. The right hand of God is the strong hand of God. Sun's out, gun's out. God's strongest hand he's going to uphold us with. Then, verse 13, I... The Lord your God will, I will hold your right hand. Typically, the right hand is the predominant hand, the stronger hand of man, but our right hand is weak. And so God, with his right hand, upholds our uh, right hand. And so he says, I will, verse 13, help you. Verse 14, you're a worm, but again, I will help you. Verse 15, I will make you into a new threshing sledge. I'm turning you from a worm into tremors. Verse 18, I will open rivers in the desolate heights. I will make the wilderness a pool of water. Verse 19, I will plant in the wilderness the trees. Verse 19, I will set in the desert the cypress. And then verse 27, I will give to Jerusalem one who brings good tidings. And so the I wills of God reinforce his promises. What God says he will do, he does. And it makes me think of the Baptist hymn we used to sing on Sunday nights when I was a kid, and I will close with this. Some of you may be familiar with this song. It went something like this. God will take care of you through every day or all the way he will take care of you god will take care of you i never really got the melody as you can see i couldn't hit (laughs) the right octave but i'm a worm No, I'm a worm with big teeth. God will take care of us. Fear not. Be not dismayed. He will help us. Father God, we thank you. And we praise you for all of your superiority. We ask, if you would, that you would please press down things in our life, truths that we probably wouldn't examine in a chapter we may not have usually spent very much time in according to our own reading and perusing. But there's such richness, Lord. Who you have been is who you will be. 
Lord, help us to see ourselves as you see us. Help us to walk in confidence and strength. And help us, Lord Jesus, not to put our trust in idols who are utterly worthless. Lord, help us to weed the idolatry out of our lives. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, as we get ready to close, you guys can stand. And I'm going to peel off down this way because here's what's going to happen. Yesterday, I got a call and Lakota Meyer and his wife Jessica said, Hey, um, our daughter would like to get uh, baptized. So little Cordelia is going to get baptized. So what we're going to do is as soon as we're done with this song, I'm going to appear out of my office in my swim, swimming trunks and baptize and close. You guys will hustle yourselves on down and get your little children's. And then we're going to align right up here by the fence and we're going to baptize Cordelia. I promise no long speeches. Just uh, we baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Bunch of clapping. And then you can beat the Baptists, most of you, um, to 12 West. And if you go to 12 West, get the double wide skillet. It's the best thing they have. All right. It's not conducive to long life, but it's quicker to glory. All right. God bless you. Just stand and let's sing this one. Sing worthy of every song. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. Mm. Jesus, Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you, oh, we live for you. And holy, there is no one like you, there is none beside you. Open up my eyes and wonder, and show me who you are, and fill me with your heart, and lead me in your love to the Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. And Jesus, Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. And holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes.
Open up my eyes. bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he lift his countenance towards you and give you peace in the name of Jesus. Let's go baptize Cordy. Right.